There was bright moonlight over the snowless landscape, but we dressed the thing and carried it home between us through the deserted streets and meadows, as we had carried a similar thing one horrible night in Arkham. We approached the house from the field in the rear, tucked the specimen in the back door and down the cellar stairs and prepared it for the usual experiment. Our fear of the police was absurdly great, though we had timed our trip to avoid the solitary patrolman of that section. Now, as much as jails and prisons were probably safer back then, It still is, uh, you know, absurdly afraid of, um, it doesn't really work as a phrase, considering the punishments that can be laid out, years in prison and all that. The results were really anticlimactic. Ghastly as our prize appeared, it was wholly unresponsive to every solution we injected in its black arm. Solutions prepared from experience with white specimens only. Now, the percentage from non-immigrant uh, black families of white has gone up, but even even if you were dealing with a pure Negro, the uh, the differences between the races aren't that much. So as the hour grew dangerously near to dawn, we did as we had done with the others, dragged the thing across the meadows to the neck of the woods near the potter's field, and buried it there And the best sort of grave the frozen ground would furnish. The grave was not very deep, but fully as good as that of the previous specimens. The thing which had risen of itself and uttered a sound, In the light of our dark lanterns, we carefully covered it with leaves and dead vines, fairly certain that the police would never find it in a forest so dim and dense. The next day, I was increasingly apprehensive about the police, for a patient brought rumors of a suspected fight and death. West had still another source of worry, for he had been called in the afternoon to a case which ended very threateningly. An Italian woman had become hysterical over her missing child, a lad of five who had strayed off early in the morning and failed to appear for dinner, and had developed symptoms alarming in view of an always weak heart. It was a very, was a very foolish hysteria, for the boy had often run away before, but Italian peasants are exceedingly superstitious, and this woman seemed as much harassed by omens as by facts. About seven o'clock in the evening, she had died, and her frantic husband had made a frightful scene in his efforts to kill West, whom he wildly blamed for not saving her life. Friends had held him when he drew a stiletto, but West departed amidst his inhuman shrieks, curses, and oaths of vengeance. In his latest affliction, the fellow seemed to have forgotten his child, who was still missing as night advanced. There was some talk of searching the woods, but most of the family's friends were busy with the dead woman and the screaming man. Altogether, the nervous strain upon West must have been tremendous. Thoughts of the police and of the mad Italian both weighed heavily. We retired about eleven, but I did not sleep well. Bolton had a surprisingly good police force for so small a town and I could not help fearing the mess which would ensue if the affair of the night before we were ever trekked down. It might mean the end of all our local work, and perhaps prison for both West and me. I did not like those rumors of a fight which were floating about. After the clock had struck three, and the moon shone in my eyes, but I turned over, without rising, to pull down the shade. Then came the steady rattling at the back door. I lay still and somewhat dazed, but before long heard West's rap on my door. He was clad in dressing gown and slippers and had in his hands a revolver and an electric flashlight. 
from the revolver, I knew that he was thinking more of the crazed Italian than of the police. We'd better both go, he whispered. It wouldn't do not to answer it anyway, and it may be a patient. It would be like one of those fools to try to the back door. So we both went down the stairs on tiptoe, with a fear partially justified of partially that which comes from the soul of the weird small hours. The rattling continued, growing somewhat louder. When we reached the door, I cautiously unbolted it and threw it open, and as the moon streamed revealingly down on the form silhouetted there, West did a peculiar thing, despite the obvious danger, attracting notice and bringing down on our heads the dreadful police investigation, a thing which, after all, was mercifully adverted by the relative isolation of our cottage. My friend suddenly, excitingly, and unnecessarily emptied all six chambers of his revolver into the nocturnal visitor, for that visitor was neither Italian nor policeman. Looming hideously against the spectral moon was a gigantic, misshapen thing, not to be imagined, save in nightmares. A glassy-eyed, ink-black apparition nearly on all fours, covered with bits of mold, leaves, and vines, foul with cake blood, and having between its glistening teeth a snow-white, terrible, cylindrical object, terminating in a tiny hand. Now, back in the day, actually, a confrontation with the police as an actual criminal, um, or, you know, or suspected criminal, was a more dangerous thing than it is today. I mean, as far as what the police are going to do themselves. But certainly personal threats are even uh, more of a concern. Four, the screams of the dead. The scream of a dead man gave to me that acute and added horror of Dr. Herbert West, which harassed the latter years of our companionship. It is natural that such a thing as a dead man's scream should give horror, for it is obviously not a pleasing or ordinary occurrence. But I was used to similar experiences, hence suffered on this occasion only because of a peculiar circumstance. And as I have implied, it was not of the dead man himself that I became afraid. Now, more often than not, it's because the person didn't actually die, that they are being embalmed, and when the fluids are being sucked out or something's put, being put in, that they groan or, or something. Uh, or people scream, come unconscious in the cremation pyre or something, uh, or, or box, or uh, however they're going to do it. Um, that, that's more reason just to bury bodies and not really... Just wrap them and bury them, then, you know, if they wake in that process, then they can do something about it. Herbert West, whose associate and assistant I was, possessed scientific interests far beyond the usual routine of a village physician. That is why, when establishing his practice in Bolton, he had chosen an isolated house near the potter's field. Briefly and brutally stated, West's sole absorbing, absorbing interest was a secret study of the phenomena of life and its cessation, leading toward the reanimation of the dead through injections of an excitant solution. For this ghastly experimenting, it was necessary to have a constant supply of very fresh human bodies. Very fresh because even the least decay hopelessly damaged the brain structure, and human because we found that the solution had to be composed differently for different types of organisms. Scores of rabbits and guinea pigs have been killed and treated, but their trail was a blind one. West had never fully succeeded because he was never able to secure a corpse sufficiently fresh. What he wanted were bodies from which vitality had only just departed, bodies with every cell intact and capable of receiving again the impulse toward that mode of motion called life. There was hope that this second and artificial life might be made perpetual by repetitions of the injection, but we had learned that an ordinary natural life would not respond to the action. To establish the artificial motion, natural life must be extinct. The specimens must be very fresh, but genuinely dead. The awesome quest had begun when West and I were students at the Miskatonic University Medical School in Arkham, vividly conscious for the first time 
of the thoroughly mechanical nature of life. That was seven years before, but West looked scarcely a day older now. He was small, blonde, clean-shaven, soft-voiced, and spectacled, with only an occasional flash of a cold blue eye to tell the hardening and growing fanaticism of his character under the pressure of his terrible investigations. Our experiences had often been hideous in the extreme. The results of defective reanimation when months of graveyard clay have been galvanized into morbid, unnatural, and brainless motion by various modifications of the vital solution. Now, electricity is another way that this sort of thing can be done. One thing had uttered a nerve-shattering scream. Another had risen violently, beaten us both unconscious to unconsciousness, and run amok in a shocking way before it could be placed behind asylum bars. Still, another, a loathsome African monstrosity, had clawed out of its shallow grave and done a deed. West had to shoot that object. We could not get bodies fresh enough to shoot any trace of reason when re when reanimated, so had, perforce, created nameless horrors. It was disturbing to think that one, perhaps two, of our monsters still lived. That thought haunted us shatteringly, till finally West disappeared under frightful circumstances. But at the time of the scream in the cellar laboratory of the isolated Bolton Cottage, our fears were subordinate, and our anxiety for extremely fresh specimens. West was more avid than I, so that it almost seemed to me that he half looked covetously at any very healthy living physique. And people with these sort of suspicions sometimes end up being killers. It was in July 1910 that the bad luck regarding specimens began to turn. I'd been on a long visit to my parents in Illinois, and... Upon my return, I found West in a state of singular elation. He had, he told me, excitingly, in all likelihood, solved the problem of freshness through an approach from an entirely new angle, that of artificial preservation. I had known that he was working on a new and highly unusual embalming compound. I was not surprised that it had turned out well, but until he explained the details, I was rather puzzled as to how such a compound could help in our work since the objectionable staleness of the specimens was largely due to delay occurring before we secured them. This I now saw. West had clearly recognized creating his embalming compound for future rather than immediate use, and trusting to fate to supply again some very recent and unburied corpses, as it had years before when we obtained the Negro killed in the Bolton Prize fight. At last, fate had been kind so that on this occasion there lay in the secret cellar laboratory a corpse whose decay could not by any possibility have begun. What would happen on reanimation, and whether we could hope for a revival of mind and reason, West did not venture to predict. The experiment would be a landmark in our studies, and he had saved the new body for my return, so that both might share the spectacle in a custom fashion. West told me, how he had obtained the specimen. It had been a vigorous man, a well-dressed stranger, just off the train on his way to transact some business with Bolton Worsted Mills. The walk through the town had been long, and by the time the traveler paused at our cottage to ask the way to the factories, his heart had become greatly overtaxed. He had refused a stimulant and had suddenly dropped dead only a moment later. The body, as might be expected, seemed to west a heaven-sent gift. In his brief conversation, the stranger had made it clear that he was unknown in Bolton, and a search of his pocket subsequently revealed him to be one Robert Leavitt of St. Louis, apparently without a family to make instant inquiries about his disappearance. If this man could not be restored to life, no one would know of our experiment. We buried our materials in a dense strip of woods between the house the potter's field. If, on the other hand, it could be restored, our fame would be brilliantly and perpetually established. So without delay, West had injected into the body's wrist the compound 
which would hold it fresh for use after my arrival. The matter of the presumably weak heart, which, to my mind, imperiled the success of our experiment, did not appear to trouble West extensively. He hoped to at last obtain what he had never obtained before, a rekindled spark of reason and perhaps a normal living creature. So on the night of July 18th, 1910, Herbert West and I stood in the cellar laboratory and gazed at a white silent, finger, uh, silent figure beneath the dazzling arc light. The embalming compound had worked uncannily well, for as I stared fascinatingly at the sturdy frame which had laid which had lain two weeks without s stiffening. I was moved to seek West's assurance that the thing was really dead. This assurance he gave readily enough, reminding me that the reanimating solution was never used without careful tests as to life, since it could have no effect if any of the original vitality were present. As West proceeded to take preliminary steps, I was impressed by the vast intricacy of the new experiment, an intricacy so vast that he could trust no hand less delicate than his own. Forbidding me to touch the body, he first injected a drug in the wrist just beside the place. His needle had punctured when injecting the embalming compound. This, he said, was to neutralize the compound and release the system to a normal relaxation so that the reanimating solution might freely work when injected. Slightly later, when a change and a gentle tremor seemed to affect the dead limbs, West stuffed a pillow-like object violently over the twitching face, not withdrawing it until the corpse appeared quiet and ready for our attempt at reanimation. Well, perhaps the guy... Well, in real life, it'd be like, well... Perhaps he was never dead. Um, and making sure he said that's... No, yeah, no. The pale enthusiast now applied some last perfunctory tests for absolute lifelessness, with the ruse satisfied and finally injected into the left arm an accurately measured amount of the vital elixir, prepared during the afternoon with a greater care than we had used since college days, when our feats were new and groping. I cannot express the wild, breathless suspense in which we waited for results on this first really fresh specimen. The first we could reasonably expect to open its lips in rational speech, perhaps to tell of what it had seen beyond the unfathomable abyss. West was a materialist, believing in no soul and attributing all the working of consciousness to bodily phenomena. Consequently, he looked for no revelation of hidden secrets from gulfs and caverns beyond death's barrier. <clears throat> I did not wholly disagree with him, theoretically, yet held vague instinctive remnants of the primitive faith of my forefathers, so that I could not help eyeing the corpse with a certain amount of awe and terrible expectations. Besides, I could not extract from my memory that hideous, inhuman shriek we heard on the night we tried our first experiment in the deserted farmhouse at Arkham. Very little time had elapsed before I saw the attempt was not to be a total failure. A touch of color came to cheeks, hither to chalk white, and spread out under the curiously ample stubble of sandy beard. West, who had his hand on the pulse of the left wrist, suddenly noted, significantly and almost simultaneously, that a mist appeared on the mirror inclined above the body's mouth. There followed a few spasmodic muscular motions, and then an audible breathing and a visible motion of the chest. I looked at the closed eyelids and thought I detected a quivering. Then the lids opened, showing eyes to which were gray, calm, and alive, but still unintelligent and not even curious. In a moment of fantastic whim, I whispered questions to the reddening ears, questions of other, world, of other worlds, of which the memory might still be present. Subsequent terror drove them from my mind, but I think the last one which I repeated was, where have you been? I do not yet know whether I was answered or not, for no sound came from the well-shaped mouth, but I do know that at that moment I firmly thought 
the thin lips move silently, forming syllables with which I have vocalized as only now. If that phrase had possessed any sense or relevancy, at that moment, as I say, I was elated with the conviction that the one great goal had been attained, and that for the first time a reanimated corpse had uttered distinct words impelled by actual reason. In the next moment, there was no doubt about the triumph, no doubt that the solution had truly accomplished, at least temporarily, its full mission of restoring rational and articulate life to the dead. But in that triumph, there came to me the greatest of all horrors, not horror of the thing that spoke, but of the deed that I had witnessed and of the man with whom my professional fortunes were joined. For that very fresh body, at last, writhing into full and terrifying consciousness with eyes dilated at the memory of its last scene on earth, throughout its frantic hands in a life and death struggle with the air, and suddenly collapsing into a second and final dissolution from which there could be no return, screamed out the cry that will ring eternally into my aching brain. Help! Keep off, you cursed little towhead fiend. Keep that damn needle away from me.